Good morning. All right. Good morning. Wow. I love baby dedications. I like them. It's a sign of life. It's a sign of new things. It's, it's really good. And so it's just wonderful. And uh, so I'm, we're going to continue moving on in our series. And as Joel May uh, mentioned, um, in light of our dedication service here today, we're going to be, I thought, you know, talking about families, talking about raising children. Training, training up children, uh, you know, how many know it's, it's tough? It's, it's always been tough, and, and I'm going to get into this here in a little bit. You know, so today, as I, um, today, I just, I've got a lot. <laughs> you know, when it comes to talking about this subject, I got a lot. And so I don't know how the conclusion's going to be today, so we'll pick it up next week. You know, I'll just stop when it seems like it's time. Does that, that just kind of mess with some people, but that'll be, that'll be how it is, you know. I remember um, Kathy was going through... Um, a fire safe that we have the other day, and and um, when she came um, came across some things for us, and and uh, um, it, it reminded me from the the, the Proverbs twenty two six, which says, "Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart depart from it." Um, in this fire box, she found a cassette tape of one of our daughters baby dedication tells you how old we are <laughs> you know now it'd be some kind of flash drive or be something digital right you know and then um, we also found uh, a letter and card from our daughters and the, the the cassette tape represents the intention that we had with our church family then to raise our child ch children in the way of the Lord um, you know, in the, in the, with the help of God and the help of our church family and our friends. And you guys here were part of, a big part of that, even though our oldest was in eighth grade when we moved up, but our youngest, Kayla, was going into first grade, so she's probably known ver a lot better than the others, but a um, big part of that. But these, re these letters remind us, these are letters that um, starts off, Mom and Dad, I just want to start saying that I love you. They're older, they're out of the house, they're grown when they wrote these, and um, it just reminds us of God's faithfulness. You know, when you get a letter from your children, uh, I mean, I got all weepy, misty-eyed and all that stuff, and you know, it just, uh, I love our kids, and I love all kids, but anyway, so I said I got a lot of stuff, kind of reminds me of, uh, of the story of a pastor who's preaching and he took his watch off and laid it on the pulpit and this little girl leans over her mom and says, Mommy, what does that mean? The mom leans over to him and to her and says, Shh, it doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, uh, you know, we've been born into our culture. That's a Christianity culture if you're a guest here first time here. That's what we're doing, this summer series, and we've been born into the culture. We can't help it. Um, we didn't ask for a culture war. It's come to us, and we're in the middle of it, and we have to respond to it, and, and that makes it difficult sometimes. You have no choice but to respond, and, and I'm seeing, and I think if you're seeing, and, and we had the conversation together, we see that the families are being redefined today, and even destroyed because of the culture because of what they're doing, and we're living in a very confusing time, and yet God has put you and me, all of us here, in this place, in this time, in this season, for a reason. Amen. Do you ever think about the fact that you're living here today, right now, God is entrusting you with this culture. With, he's entrusting with you with what to do about the now. Just think about that. He's, he's, he's saying, I trust you to do this. I trust you to take care of this. And granted, some people take better care of it than others. Yeah, we, I, I understand that. But he's asking us and he's entrusting us. And, and, and we're living that time. And I believe that's why this summer series is so important for us. Um, think about this. The parents that were up here today, God bless them. You know, they, some of them have had struggles already. Um, I love the fact that that David and Rachel had twins. <laughs> David loves to hunt. <laughs> Wait a minute. David loved to hunt. <laughs> you know. 
where are they at? Anyway, they take off. Anyway, so um, it, it just, it just, it's just great. Um, and so, you know, most of the parents that were up, the parents that are up here, and most of us, and most parents in general that are Christians, they, they, they were up there. They, many want good kids, and maybe even beyond those that aren't Christian, want good kids, right? We just say most parents want good kids, you know, and, but most parents don't necessarily pray that they will have godly children. And you need to understand that there's a difference. Our prayer for our children should be that God would capture their hearts. As I journal every day, as I, thank you for that, Steve, that, you know, if you want to have prayers answered, it starts with having prayers given, right? Um, as I, every morning I'm up and I, I'm doing my, my thing with God and I, I'm reading my Bible and I, I journal and I write, but, and then we have this calendar that, uh, for several years, our daughters have made for us. They give it to us at Christmas time. In fact, one year I said, are we going to get that calendar? Because I really like that. It, it highlights a member of the family. It could be a grandchild. It could be one of my children. It could be uh, Kathy's mom, my mom, or whatever. And that person it gets, it gets a special prayer every day, and I write a prayer for them in my journal every day and, and stuff. So, so I, I do those things, and, 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 and that my prayer for my children and my grandchildren is always to something that, like this, that God draw them. May they have your heart. May they love you. May they serve you. May they, may they be a, by the little ones, I say, God, make him a warrior child for you. you know, make him what you want him to be. You know, and those are the types of prayers that I pray for my children. Because I want, I want my grandchildren, my children, yeah, still to be godly. People who have God's heart, the heart of God. You see, thieves are stealing our children today. There are thieves that are stealing our children today. The th if a thief broke into your house and stole, kidnapped a child, you would call the police, right? But because these thieves don't do that, because these thieves steal the soul, and many parents don't care. And if they do care, a lot of parents don't know what to do. What am I going to do? Because I believe that we're living in one of the most anti-family times in all of history. We really are. Now, of course, the family's always been under attack, and, and, the, and the church you've always had the church in the middle of paganism. But we are living in a time, you know, that's not new for that, but a time when I believe that we're under attack like never before. I mentioned last week uh, of the 45 goals of communism that was read into the congressional uh, minutes in uh, January of 1963. And of those 45 goals, I, I'd just like you to think about if you're seeing this today. Okay? 45 goals, there are a number of them that are attacking the family. The family, how I many of the family is the nucleus of our culture, of our of, of what we have. The very God created Adam and Eve, and what did he say? He wanted them to have a family, right? That, that's God's idea, and Satan is always against God's idea. So God says, let's do this. Satan says, let's tear it apart. That's how it is. So, of the 45 goals, here they are. Just goal number 17, get control of the schools. Goal number 18, gain control of student newspapers. Goal 21, gain control of TV, radio, and motion pictures. 1963, people. Goal 24, eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling them censorship and a violation of free speech and free press. Goal 25, break down cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography, obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV. 1963. Goal 26, present homosexuality, degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal, natural, and healthy. Goal 28, eliminate prayer of any phase of religious expression in the school. Goal 40, discredit the family as an institution, encourage promiscuity, and easy divorce. 1963, people. Goal 41, emphasize the need to raise children away from the negative influence of parents. Do you see any of this happening at all, or am I just watching the wrong tube? No generation in the past has ever had to live and raise children with violent movies and sexuality. 
And now with the click of a mouse, you can have a porn shop in your own house. It's easy. It can be done. Our challenges, people, are unique. Never before in history have parents tried to rear children under those conditions. And those parents that we just blessed today and encouraged today, you're going, great. <laughs> great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> So my question for all of us is, if you're a parent, what are you doing as a parent? What are you doing? What, what are you doing to faithfully, intentionally, and unitedly stand against a culture that wants your child and is willing to do anything possible to get the soul of those that you love? As I said earlier, most Christian parents do not want godly children. What we want is good children. Children that aren't going to hassle us. Children that are going to not get into, into sex and drugs. Children that are going to, uh, we won't, won't, will fit in with others and won't give us a hard time. But not necessarily godly children who will stand against the culture. Because in the minds of a lot of parents, the worst thing you can do is expect your child to say no to their friends and, and not get involved. Expect their child to stand against what their friends are doing. And if the child can't, can't do it, we think that it's really awful because the child's going to feel bad. We don't want them to feel bad. We have too many parents that want to be friends. To the families that were up here this morning, your charge is to be a mom and dad, to be a parent, not a friend. They have enough friends, and they still blow that. I mean, no, I had friends I should not have had, but I have friends. You need to be the people who guide and direct and focus people. So, what is it that we're after as we raise our children? Do we want independent, spirit-filled children who know the difference between right and wrong and have the courage and the power to do what's right? I mean, that sounds good, right? That sounds like, yeah, I, yeah, I, I'll take that. Well, let me just say this. I think the Bible has a different answer. And I think the Bible's answer is the better answer. See, according to the Bible, we are to raise our children to love the Lord our God with all, our, all their hearts, all their minds, with all themselves, and to love their neighbor as they love themselves. That's what we're called to do. That's what God wants. Not just good kids, but godly kids. And maybe we need to start using different language and said, I want good kids. We need to say, I want godly kids. Because that puts the pressure on me as a grandpa. What am I going to do to interject into the lives of my grandchildren? And sometimes you say, oh, I can't go there. Guess what? If you're in my house, you're going to go there. Because you're in my house. You know? Sometimes it's Kathy and I really have to say, oh, you know. Yeah. And, and I'm going, you know. Anyway, that's the Whole other thing. So I'm going to give you some principles today. Start with some principles today of raising godly children. So crack open your Bibles. Go to the front of your Bible to the book of Deuteronomy. We're going way back to the beginning, and, and we're going to get into that. And while you're getting there, I want you to understand something. That what we're doing today, what we're talking about today, um, is trouble. Because today, uh, we're entering into Satan's territory. This is where he rules this is where Satan is Lord. This is what he wants. When what Satan is saying, he says, I'm going to get your children. If it's not through the internet, it'll be through movies. And if it's not through movies, it's going to be through their friends. And if it's not through their friends, it's from school, it's going to be through drugs. But one way or another, I am going to get your children. And I'm here to tell you today that by God's grace, we have to say, no, you're not going to get my kids. You're not going to, you know what we need? I got a, my computer, and your computer too, has firewalls. What's a firewall for? Anybody? Anybody? Pardon? Pardon? Keep the bad out. Keep the virus away from getting and infecting your, your, we need to be the firewall that says, no, you cannot get, the firewall in the family says, no, you can't get into my family. I'm not going to let you. And we have to be the ones that are on our knees, that are praying for that, that are praying God's blessing and praying for their children and stopping Satan. Where they are. Amen? We've got to do that, don't we? So anyway, so I better get into this, get away from my notes and look what happens. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
says this. F turns on. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. This is Moses speaking to the children of Israel. God has given us to him, and now he's relating it that, back to them. He says, first, you must, must obey, not an option, you must obey them, these commands, in the land that you are about to enter and to occupy. You're getting ready to go into the promised land. I've got to give you some instructions here. And you and your children and your grandchildren, he's taking it down. It's not just you, but you've got to make sure your children do it. You've got to make sure your grandchildren do this. Must do what? Well, Moses, what? Fear the Lord, not as in I'm afraid of you, but as in reverential fear of God and respect. Fear the Lord your God. How long do we do that, Moses? As long as you live. And then he goes on, if, there's that if, man, two letters and all it is, if, okay. If you obey how many of his decrees? All the decrees and commands. You will enjoy a long life. That's what's going to happen. If you do it, you're going to have a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful today to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God. How do we love him, Moses? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And you must commit yourselves. There it is. Be committed. Commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. So how would he do that? How do we commit ourselves, Moses? Repeat them. Repeat them again and again to your children. How do we repeat them? Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them on your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Wow. So God says, mothers and fathers, moms and dads, you have the responsibility of passing the torch to your children. And God says, the goal is to love me with all your heart, and to teach your children to love me and to fear me. So when we're going to do this, it means we're going to be counter-cultural. Kind of like if you watch The Chosen, I like the, the image they give us of these fish swimming in the same direction, and all of a sudden one turns around and goes against the green. I like that image. So I have some principles. I'm going to start this week, and I'll finish next week. So if you have notes, here we go. Principle number one. Understand the culture and your children's activities. Understand the culture we live in and your children's activities. Parents, do you know what movies your children are watching? Do you know, do you know who they're watching them with, what they're doing? Do you know who the children's friends are? Do you understand who their friends are? When your children come home from school, do you say, how was your day at school today? And you listen non-judgmentally so they can tell you so often. We, they start talking and then we want to interject something, but listen, non-judgmentally and, and absorbing it, not reacting, trying to correct, but trying to say this or that, but you're learning and you're listening. Mom and dad, are you doing that? Do you know where your child is? Have you entered your child's life and know what happens at school or the friends that he or she has? We've had times when we've turned on the news and if you didn't watch the news last night and hear about President Donald Trump, former President Donald Trump being shot last night, you might turn the news on today and find out he was assassination attempt was attempted on his life. But we have other times we turn on the news and what do we see? We see a terrible story of a school shooting, right? Then we find out, and as the story progresses, we find out they, that they uh, interview parents and they talk to them. And, and many times you'll say, you hear parents say, oh, we didn't know. You know, we thought everything was fine. And they investigate a little further, dig a little deeper, and they find out that, they find out what the kid, the child, the shooter is watching, looking at on the website. And then we hear the parents that talk to their, if, we hear that if the parents had talked to their teenager, if the parents had seen some of the warning signs, the notes that they wrote, if the parents had gone into the child's room, they'd have known that this child was on a very dangerous path. But parents say, well, I can't go into my child's room. <laughs> really? <laughs> Let me just say, mom and dads, it is your house. 
It is your home. You're responsible for every centimeter of that home, even in your child's room. Yes, you can go into your child's room. Of course, <laughs> yeah, I can just envision people, if you're watching, don't go snooping today because, uh, well, the preacher said that. You can go in my child's room. If you, if you go snooping in your child's room, the child's going to reject that. But what I'm saying is there needs to be a relationship where you can say, it's important for me to know what you're watching, and it's important to me to know what's, what's going on and who you're hanging out with in school. And if the child says, hey, it's none of your business, then I want to encourage you to sweetly, gently, <laughs> kindly, say, lovingly, say, make it your business. <laughs> I want to encourage you to do that because God says it is your business. You know, amen? amen. It's your business. Parents be parents. I remember when emailing just was a thing. And our, our daughters got their email accounts, they set up email accounts on our computer. And I told the girls, I said, okay, um, here's, what, here's the deal. I want to know all your account information. And they looked at me, oh, dad, it's private, it's ours. No, it's not. I want to know, why do you want to know, dad? Because I want to be able to get on there anytime I want and see who you're corresponding with and see what's going on. Are you going to go look on it all every day? Every day? I said, no, just when I want, you see. <laughs> when you say just when I don't want, they don't know when that is, right? So, I, so, but that's the type of thing that, that I wanted to make sure. So, so many parents think that if, if I don't deal with this, it's either A, it won't be there, it'll take care of itself, or B, it just go away, and, and what, I, what I don't investigate somehow is going to turn out okay. Two words for those two assumptions is, it won't. <laughs> it won't, okay? So number one, be informed about the culture of your children's activities. Number two, combine a strong relationship with rules. Have a meaningful relationship with your children. The, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Why? This is right. Going down to verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. One of the ways parents provoke their children to anger is to have rules and to say, these are the rules, I'm going to follow these rules. Right here, this is the line. You know, after sermons like this, families go home and get together, we're going to have rules in this house. You know, and, 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 and what happens, there's no heart in that. Without the heart, without the relationship, the begin, children would begin to rebel and they begin to say, like, well, I hate my dad. Because I hate my dad, I hate his God. And they begin to despise rules and that because they don't like the father or the mother or whoever, they, they will deliberately do what that parent does not want done. So from my heart to yours, please understand, rules have no power in and of themselves to keep your child away from going in the wrong direction. Only relationships do that. I've said this many times. That some of you heard me say this. If you're in leadership, you've heard me say this, that adequate preaching will, will be attractive to some people attract in the church. Adequate preaching will bring people. Good music will bring people. But relationships keep people. It's the relationships that we make that keep people. So rules are important, but relationships... It's a relationship that's the strength. It's that loving relationship where the child wants to please you. So principle number two, combine meaningful relationship with rules. <sighs> number three, I'm going to get this out, get it over with, because I'll hear, I'll get the emails later, or text message later. <laughs> number three, discipline. Oh, I was wondering if he's going to get to that. <laughs> discipline is essential. Proverbs 13, 24 tells us this. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline themselves. And the question in a lot of people in this room and maybe watching on the internet right now is, I wonder what Tim thinks about spanking. So, yes, I believe you should spank your children. One uh, appropriate. And I'm not going to leave it at that. Over and over the Bible, over and over the Bible, it says to spank your children. I've, I've given you passages on the note sheet that you can look up, uh, but hear me out. Do not use that for ammunition, but hear me out on this, because I'm not going to leave it just with this. I, I believe this. There are two reasons why 
I see that why spanking children is not popular today. One is because of abuse, and that makes perfect sense to me. If you're abusive and angry and you just start wailing away at your child, um, you know, then do not touch your child. It is not a time for any adult to get something off their chest, some anger or whatever, and start wailing, spanking your child. For you don't do that. That's not what spanking is for. And if that's how you're spanking your child, then stop. Just that easy. Stop it. You know, the purpose of spanking is to make sure that the will of the child is broken, and not the spirit of the child. You must do it with care. And never spank your child without later going to your child lovingly, putting your arms around the child, and making sure your child knows that you love them, and that you care for them, and you want the best for them. Because if you want a healthy, emotional child who can function well as somebody who loves God, then he or she at times needs to be spanked. And some more than others, unfortunately. I mean, oh boy. Um, a second reason is humanistic ideas. Oh, your, your little child is so good. Negotiate with them. Oh, please. Anybody ever tried to negotiate with a rebellious, disrespectful three-year-old? <laughs> Does it work? <clears throat> Ain't working, is it, Aubrey? No, it doesn't. It doesn't, you know? One of the things that I fear that more Christians are doing today is getting their advice from the Dr. Phil's of the world and not the Bible. And, and I'm not against the Dr. Phil's. They, Dr. Phil's of the world, they have some good stuff. They have, they, they, they have, you know, there may be some wisdom there, but they will never teach you how to raise your child who love the Lord, uh, children who love the Lord, their God, with all their heart, with all their soul, and all their mind, and, and they won't teach you that. Ray Comfort, um, in one of his messages, um, said that he disciplined one of his children. And he, he said he, he gave his son a spanking because of open, willful defiance. And that's what I, one of the things, criteria I have personally is when they have opal, open, willful defiance against you. I had one of my, two of my kids, at one time with a real little, stuck their tongues out at me. That wasn't a good deal. So they, they learned that, that you shouldn't do that, okay? They're just, Anyway, um, so he, he, spanked his, his, because of, he spanked his son because of defiance and then hugged his boys, he, his son. He said, now you stay here, and when you're finished crying, you come to me. And the little boy, sniffling, found a sheet of paper and started writing, and Ray Comforts wondered, what, what is he writing on that? And the little boy wrote on it, I love you, Daddy. The very same day, a neighbor child who'd never been spanked never been disciplined, said to his mother, I hate you. That's the difference. Proverbs 29, 15, and verse 17 tells us this. The rod of reproof gives wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. Correct your son, and he will give you comfort. He will also delight your soul. That's just how it is. That's how it is. So do you want your child to love you? Do you want your child to hate you? Of course, there's, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a really complicated issue, but, but we as parents, need what we need is great wisdom in dealing with our kids. And of course, if you have children, you know that some of them are different. They have different personalities. I mean, there is the child that you can discipline by spanking or whatever, and they, they're not going to get it. We had one of our ch children, I just said, man, I'm disappointed. Well, oh, the floodgates are opened up. I mean, just, ah! You know, she was just out to try to please mom and dad at all costs, you know. We just, we just had to say something like that. We had another one that, well, you know, when she was just a little toddler, she would pick things up and we'd say, no, don't do that. And we'd tap her hand and she'd just go and look at you again. <laughs> and, and, and just like, oh. So they're all different. You have to under, take that all into account. Uh, but one of the things we can do for our children, of course, for the greater culture... Pray for them. Amen. Pray for them. And one of the things we need to pray for is that God will have their hearts. I challenge you to pray that God would have your children's hearts. It isn't just a matter of behavior. It's a matter of the heart. And what is, what is it that God wants for our children? 
to love him with all of their heart, soul, and mind. I'm going to leave you with this illustration. The passage from Deuteronomy that we just looked at, chapter 6, is calling for us to teach our children and calling for moms and dads to pour into their lives, God, pour God's way into their lives. It's kind of like this bottle of water. Now, the bottle's pretty flimsy and the cap's, the cap's pretty flimsy, and I'm pretty sure that if I squeeze hard enough, I could pop that cap. So I'm not going to go there, but just work with me on this. Pretend the cap is rock solid and it's not going to go anywhere. Let's say this is your child, the bottle is your child. And the truth of God's word and God's love and God's ways is what you pour into your child. Now the world is going to come into your child from the outside. The bottle is hard. It's, it's hard to crush. If this bottle was empty, nothing inside it, how many know I could crush it really easy, right? It's hard to crush because of what God has been poured into the child is helping keep the world away. The world is going to come at your child and it's going to exert pressure, but the greater your pressure is and the volume you have inside, the world can't affect the child. Does that make sense? Amen. It did. Okay. That's what we need to do, pour into our children. So I'm going to have more for you next week. Um, so I'll have the other principles along the way for next week.